From the threadbare Minutemen who confronted the Redcoats at Concord in 1775, to the trillion dollar juggernaut that rose to the pinnacle of United States military power at the dawn of the 21st century, the United States Army has been the first instrument of gaining American freedoms and holding them firm against tyranny. The Army is the American institution that provided the ability for our, the United States to declare its independence. It was the institution that won that independence. The Army was the institution that brought about the ability to have freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of religion. But for the United States Army, the road was a long and hard one. For most of its history, it was ill-equipped, scantily clothed, and all too often badly led. Yet when American soldiers had to fight, they did magnificently. At critical moments, they found the leaders. They found the arms. They never had to find the heart. And at the end of all America's wars, the army stood fearsome and undefeated. To follow the hallowed battle flags of the United States Army is to know its greatness. As the tensions between the American colonists and the English crown heightened in the late 18th century, the occupying Redcoat Army, led by General Thomas Gage, had few concerns with its ability to deal with an armed insurrection. The central military institution in the colonies was the militia, armed forces not part of any regular army, raised by the states from civilian populations. With many veterans of the Indian and colonial wars, they embodied the skills of war and the responsibility of towns and cities to conduct their own defenses. It was an instant army that could appear suddenly on any battlefield. So when hostilities broke out at Lexington and Concord, Massachusetts, the royal forces received a cruel shock. We have this fanciful notion that the Battle of Lexington and Concord was fought by a bunch of farmers who just seized a musket off the wall. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The Americans had been training an army in the interior of Massachusetts, and they, they didn't just come out as individuals. They came out as companies, as regiments. They had colonels, majors, lieutenants giving them orders on the battlefield. It was a very sophisticated battle was fought. One of the rare legends of history who lived up to and surpassed his mythology was the Army's first commander-in-chief. George Washington was a battle-hardened military officer who had served as aide-de-camp to two British generals during the French and Indian War. He was a military, logistical, and organizational genius he was the wisest military decision any American Congress ever made. The war's early days went well for Washington, with his New Englanders bloodying the British in skirmishes at Bunker and Breed's Hill outside Boston. He then lay siege to the city to drive the enemy to a sea evacuation of Boston which left the British with no forces in the American colonies. Washington realized that the Redcoats would return and that his future battles couldn't be won with local militias that could disappear at harvest time or refuse to accept orders from officers from a different colony. He wanted regulars who fought for all the 13 colonies, not just one. 
regulars he could count on for two years, not just 60 days. But it was a forlorn wish. The Congress simply could not afford it. So what he had to make do with was a relatively small Continental Army that he moved from one place to another, and then the militia to rally around that Continental Army when it appeared that a battle was about to occur. After the United States declared its independence in July of 1776, the British returned with a huge 30,000-man army to finish off Washington's weak force of 10,000. Driving to take New York, the enemy landed in Brooklyn, where Washington engaged them in August. But in the Battle of Long Island, his undisciplined forces were routed by the well-drilled redcoats. He was lucky to get his army back across the river into New York. He now saw that he had to move away from the European tradition of wars being decided in a great battle or two. And he wrote a letter to the president of the Continental Congress, and he said, from now on, we will never seek a general action. Instead, we will protract the war. This is one of the most brilliant strategic decisions that any American general ever made. The secret of winning the revolution was right there in those words. The Americans were turning another European tradition on its head. In European armies of the 18th century, the command is present or present your firelocks, at which point everybody points their muskets towards the enemy and turns their heads away so that the gunpowder, when it flashes up, won't hit him in the eyes. Our army is the first to use the word aim when they're firing weapons. So if you look at any battle in the American Revolution, you will usually see there are more British killed and more British wounded than there are Americans killed and wounded. In addition to deadly marksmanship, audacity was becoming a signature of an increasingly tough American army. On December 26, 1776, Washington led his regulars down to barely 4,000 men across the Delaware River in a bold attack that destroyed a formidable Hessian unit at Trenton, New Jersey. On January 3rd, 1777, the same army routed the British at Princeton. In 10 days, the American army that the British had completely discounted had all but chased them out of New Jersey. In October, it routed the British at Saratoga. There were many things the young United States Army hadn't learned. And how to quit was one of them. turned their army's victories in 1777 to political advantage. United States Ambassador Benjamin Franklin coaxed and goaded France, Spain, and the Netherlands into accepting the young army's staying power, and they offered support against the British in men and munitions. Washington had found the answer to his critical shortage of battle-tested, classically trained leaders. He set about granting high commissions to brilliant foreign officers. Tadeusz Kosciuszko, the Marquis de Lafayette, Count Casimir Pulaski, and Baron Wilhelm Friedrich von Steuben. Von Steuben would do the most to begin to shape the American army to what it would become. And he writes a set of regulations, a training manual for the United States Army called the Regulations for the Order and Discipline of the Troops of the United States, Part One. And it's a fabulous distillation of a sophisticated European idea that the Europeans know as Napoleonic warfare.
She taught a doctrine which is very, very important in the whole history of the U.S. Army, and that was an officer's chief responsibility is not to save his own life or not to make himself comfortable, uh, but to see to the comfort and the, the well-being of his men. Steuben said, in the end, what I want to see between an officer and his men is love, going both ways. By May of 1780, the British shifted a stalemated New England war to the southern colonies. But a tough, elusive American army under new battle leaders such as Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox, Thomas Sumter, Daniel Morgan, and Andrew Pickens fought partisan actions against the Redcoats under General Charles Cornwallis. By January 1781, a showdown battle for the South was shaping up at Cowpens, South Carolina. General Daniel Morgan, the bellicose leader of the guerrilla raiders known as Morgan's Rangers, found a way to win with a mix of militia and regulars in a fight in the open field. He told his shaky but sharpshooting militia to hold for just two volleys to pick off the British officers, and then they could run for it and leave the fight to the regulars. That strategy and a determined American bayonet charge produced a complete rout and surrender of the British, changed the complexion of the war, and set up its spectacular end. By the middle of 1781, the mauled and frustrated British had retreated to their port enclaves, New York, Charleston, Savannah, and a spot on the Virginia Peninsula near Yorktown. Without quite knowing it, the Americans, after five years of war, were in sight of ultimate victory. In the summer of, of 1781, uh, they got this electrifying message from the commander of the French fleet in the West Indies, saying that he was coming to the American coast and he wanted to know where he could do the most good. Washington left some troops up north to hold General Clinton in place in New York City and slipped away with the main part of the army to Virginia to besiege Yorktown. The French fleet arrived and on September 5th defeated a British fleet that came down to relieve Cornwallis. Cornwallis was trapped. The culminating battle of the American Revolution is the successful siege of Yorktown, in which the Americans, working closely with the French, defeat Lord Cornwallis and capture a large part of the British Army. When the news got to England that this British Army had surrendered, Lord North, the British Prime Minister, was said to have paced up and down in his chambers saying, oh my God, it's all over, it's all over, and it was. A United States Army scraped off the streets and out of the woods had defeated the most powerful nation on earth. But the young army did not survive the war. We've forgotten another thing about the American army, that it died after the Revolution. The Continental Congress, which was transmogrified into the regular Congress, they discharged the entire American army, that not one unit was re remained. By 1784, the public security of the United States against both rampaging Indians and foreign power was in the hands of only 80 regulars and 700 volunteer militia. Finally, the tight-fisted government began to worry enough to allow some military expansion. In 1802, President Thomas Jefferson recognized the need for a professionally trained officer corps for the Army 
and recommended that Congress found the United States Military Academy at West Point. It would slowly rise to become the bedrock of Army greatness. But even 10 years later, the ragged army struck no fear in foreign nations. By the early 19th century, Britain, hard pressed by its long war with Napoleon, began to interfere with French-American sea trade. To make up for its high desertion rate, the Royal Navy began impressing American seamen into its service. On June 18, 1812, the United States, with its small, shaky army, declared war on the mighty Great Britain. The War of 1812 was mostly a stream of indecisive stumbles and humiliations for another hard-fighting but unprepared U.S. Army against an English enemy that scorned it and the country it stood for. The American Army's invasion into Canada, hobbled by a militia reluctant to fight outside the United States, bogged down despite some good performance by the regulars. The Army's bright spot in the Canadian fighting was the performance of young General Winfield Scott, beginning what would be 50 years of exemplary service. He fought neat but non-decisive battles against odds at Chippewa, Niagara Falls, and Lundy's Lane in July of 1814. And although his army couldn't take Canada, it thwarted the British plans to invade the United States from there. But the British had other plans to invade the South. On August 19, 1814, 4,500 British troops landed by sea in Maryland and began a march against Washington, D.C., now the American capital. Five days after landing, they had brushed aside U.S. forces at Bladensburg, taken Washington, and brazenly burned the public buildings of a nation pathetically unable to muster an army to defend its very heart. The British looked for a decisive victory. By December 23, 1814, 1,800 tough British soldiers had landed near New Orleans. Confidently, they swept toward that rich prize, controlling the mouth of the Mississippi and its commerce. They were veterans of the Napoleonic Wars, led by Major General Sir Edward Parkinham, son-in-law to Napoleon's conqueror, the Duke of Wellington. The opposing general had no such lofty credentials. Andrew Jackson was a hard-drinking militia general and sometime duelist. They called him Old Hickory. He might bend, but he would not break. Andrew Jackson took command of a jumbled together 5,700-man force of regulars. Tennessee, Kentucky, and Louisiana militia units free blacks, and even some pirates under the Frenchman Jean Lafitte. The Eight-Day Battle of New Orleans began on New Year's Day, 1815. British bravery in the frontal attack was no match for the American army, barricaded behind cotton bales along the 20-foot-wide Rodriguez Canal. General Parkinham fell dead, along with 2,444 of his men killed, wounded, and captured in what would be a disastrous and defeated campaign. The American army lost just 336 men. Tragically, the battle turned out to have been fought after the war's end. But thanks to the army, the United States had become a power to be respected. The army would also become an instrument of territorial expansion.
The next war that America fought was extremely important in the evolution of the U.S. Army. It's the war with Mexico. In March of 1846, President James Polk, an avid believer in United States expansion, sent the 2,200-man army under aggressive General Zachary Taylor into a disputed region below the Nueces River to protect the annexation of Texas. Fighting short, victorious battles at Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma in May, The incursion would escalate into a prolonged, nasty conflict against a brave and bloodied Mexican army of 30,000. The war would begin to set the fighting style of the U.S. Army and launch the United States as a continental power stretching from ocean to ocean. As the opening battles of the Mexican War ended, the U.S. Army found itself fighting a big, strong enemy on his home ground. The Army increasingly patched up its deficiencies with clever use of light, easily towed field artillery, well directed by West Point graduates, including young Lieutenant Robert E. Lee. If you had to pick out one favored arm in the United States Army, it is unquestionably the artillery. Pursuing a, a philosophy of never sending a man where you can send a cannonball. The army swelled with eager volunteers, split its forces, and dispatched them efficiently under great leaders like Colonel Stephen Kearney and Colonel Alexander Donovan, who made epic marches and vast conquests throughout the Southwest. They sent one army down into what is, we now call New Mexico, and uh, uh, they, they marched overland through the desert and uh, occupied this whole territory down there around Santa Fe, uh, a huge uh, chunk of the continent. That was a fairly small army. They, they really didn't fight any battles worth mentioning. Meanwhile, another army marched overland to California, a, another small army, and Marines and, and uh, sailors landed from the American fleet and we captured California with practically no loss of life. Few armies in all of history ever took as much valuable territory in so little time and with so little bloodshed as the dauntless and daring United States Army of the Mexican War. We decided we had to launch an attack that would carry us all the way to the capital of Mexico. They handed the job of fighting through to the Mexican capital to the legendary hero of 1812, General Winfield Scott. On March 9, 1847, the United States Army set a tradition of huge, brilliant amphibious operations against enemy shores. The United States Army, with the close support of the Navy, landed 11,000 men on the Mexican East Coast near the port of Veracruz. The genius of Winfield Scott was everywhere. He was a first-class leader of men. He was an innovator. Uh, the first amphibious equipment that the United States ever owned, he designed personally. When troops went ashore uh, in Mexico in the uh, early part of the Mexican War, they got ashore on board an amphibious flat-bottom boat designed uh, to be stackable on uh, merchant shipping, uh, a design done by Winfield Scott personally. Scott took Vera Cruz after a 20-day siege. He then set about taking his 11,000 men 250 miles to Mexico City and its 33,000 defenders. All this through a country of 11 million hostile people. No less a British military giant than the Duke of Wellington predicted that no one would ever hear of the United States Army again. Undaunted by the odds, Winfield Scott reeled off victories at Cerro Gordo, Contreras, Churubusco, Molina del Rey, and Capultepec, fighting his way toward Mexico City through the summer of 1847. 
He won with skill, stealth, and surprise, picking spots where the Mexicans could be outflanked or attacked at night. His victories ended the defense of Mexico City and the Mexican War. On September 14, 1847, to the tune of Yankee Doodle, Scott and his army entered Mexico City. 13,000 Americans had died, but the United States had won all the territory between the Louisiana Purchase and the Pacific Coast. The United States was a continental power. But its next crisis would come within its own borders. On April 12, 1861, the federal garrison at Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor was attacked and taken. It was the culmination of a long regional dispute between the states involving deep economic issues and the institution of slavery. When President Lincoln made clear that he would oppose the intended secession of 11 southern states from the Union with force, America's most terrible war began. There are actually two American armies, of course, in the American Civil War, the Confederates and the Union. Uh, both of them had about the same leadership. Officers in the army were split almost down the middle, uh, half going south, half uh, staying with the north. And the soldiers mostly were volunteers, and anyone who studies the history of the volunteers into the two armies must be astounded how many young men left their families, left their work, left everything because they thought they were fighting for something worthwhile. The aging, canny Winfield Scott called to his third war in 49 years, now as General-in-Chief, saw the situation realistically. Scott declared that the Army, only 16,000 strong and with half its best officers gone south, was not yet in any strength or condition to fight. But for Lincoln, speed was the key to success. The 75,000 men he had called up to augment the regulars had an enlistment span of just 90 days. The Union invasion of the South began quickly in July. Most of the federal troops were massed in Washington, and they moved out to face the Confederates near Manassas Junction along Bull Run Creek. The United States Army was about to get a humbling lesson in war. On July 21st, 1861, Union General Irwin McDowell's feeble attempt at envelopment in the Battle of Bull Run broke down in the fumbling of inexperienced troops and commanders. Meanwhile, the Confederates under fine generals like Joseph Johnston, Jeb Stuart, and Stonewall Jackson had adroitly shifted reinforcements by rail from the Shenandoah Valley and fell upon the Union flank. The confused Federals gradually gave way to a pell-mell retreat that didn't stop until it reached Washington. They lost nearly 3,000 men. Many in the North uh, were expecting quick and easy victories. When that didn't come, it uh, totally changed the uh, complexion of the war and began to change the attitudes toward the war.
a flashy, bright young general named George C. McClellan managed to convince President Lincoln that he could capture the rebel capital, Richmond, by a lightning-like amphibious flanking with his 194,000 men. But McClellan was the wrong man to do anything lightning-like. He had what Lincoln would come to call the slows. He sees all the shortages, all the lack of training, and all the weaknesses in subordinate leaders. And as a result, he can see the harm the enemy might do to him more than he can see the harm he could do to the enemy. Given time, the Confederates attacked McClellan at Seven Pines, with rebel leadership passing to a brilliant West Pointer who had turned down command of the Union armies to fight for his native Virginia, General Robert E. Lee. General Lee was uh, clearly among the top military leaders of the day, and uh, when he decided to go south, it was a serious loss for the Union Army. And it really wasn't until the uh, crisis around Richmond in the summer of 62 that he was given field command. He immediately uh, showed his ability to get the best out of the troops available. The Peninsula campaign battles at Fair Oaks, Gaines Mill, and Malvern Hill saw Lee assert his trademark aggressiveness and willingness to take stiff casualties to get victories. His stubborn fighting in these battles ended McClellan's threat to Richmond. Lincoln discarded the disappointing McClellan and began a dispiriting search for the right man to lead his armies. His next selection, General Ambrose Burnside, lost 10,000 men in headlong assaults on Confederates entrenched at Fredericksburg in a failed attempt to cross the Rappahannock River. Lincoln's next bad choice to lead the Army of the Potomac was General Joseph Hooker, a sound operational officer. But now he too failed at a crucial instant in the Great Battle of Chancellorsville on May 2nd, 1863. Hooker lost both his nerve and a great battle when he allowed his superior forces to be outflanked and outfought by the brilliant Lee. seemed invincible. He began planning to invade northern soil decisively, win victories, and gain an increasingly impressive South crucial foreign recognition and aid. The march to Gettysburg had begun. But far away in the Western theater, the man who would become Lee's nemesis had been busy moving into a complex, coordinated attack on the South's Bastion of Vicksburg, commanding the Mississippi from high bluffs. General Ulysses S. Grant, leading the siege, was a failed storekeeper with a taste for whiskey. Grant was basically an unsuccessful man in everything he tried until the Civil War began, but when he received the opportunity to command in the Civil War, he uh, quickly proved his uh, worth, not only as an administrator, but as a commander. Grant had a broad strategic vision of the war. He saw that cutting the South in half by closing off its Mississippi River traffic was the key to smothering the Confederacy. Grant ran the most sophisticated coordination of land and naval forces in the history of the United States Army. Using steam-powered troop transports and Navy gunboats to land troops and provide supporting bombardment, he moved his 41,000 troops through and around formidable barricades. Soon his siege mortars pounded Vicksburg and cut off its 20,000 defenders from land and the river. This bulldog of a general was beginning to show the qualities that would hound the Confederacy to its doom.
In the summer of 1863, the United States Army was still frantically changing commanders, trying to find the man to stem the seemingly unbeatable Robert E. Lee. This time, the Army chose General George Gordon Meade. Meade had no spark of genius, but he was a highly competent artisan who sought battle and would not be frightened off. Thirsting to meet Lee in decisive combat as the Confederate Army moved north, Meade gathered his forces near Frederick, Maryland. The forces began to brush together near the small Pennsylvania town of Gettysburg. The United States Army was soon in the battle to decide the very life of the United States. The Battle of Gettysburg raged for three days in blistering heat. The U.S. Army's barely won occupation of high ground, such as Little Round Top in the early battle, could not be overcome by Confederate courage. A defining moment came when Colonel Joshua Chamberlain led his 20th Maine militia in a bayonet charge with empty rifles to hold the priceless height. Places like Culp's Hill, the Wheatfield and Devil's Den became blood-soaked monuments to American soldiers' courage and sacrifice. On the blazing afternoon of July 3rd, 1863, Lee gambled all on a 12,000-man charge on the Union Center across open ground, swept by the fire of barricaded Federal soldiers and artillery. Dueling guns could be heard as far away as Pittsburgh. Commanding the charge to be emblazoned with his name, the dashing Southern General George Pickett drove his men to what would be called the high water mark of the Confederacy. Southern losses were shocking. The surviving vanguard of the charge leaped the stone wall into the federal positions. But the mighty torrent had been bled down to a trickle and the attack was crushed. The battle was over with Lee's army having lost 28,000 men to the Union's 23,000. Never before and never again would so many American fighting men fall in one battle. Meade failed to follow the broken enemy and Lee made good his escape south. But an even greater Union victory came the next day On July 4, 1863, a starving Vicksburg garrison surrendered to Grant. The Union commanded the Mississippi River. The South was cut in two. Lincoln, dissatisfied with Meade's lack of pursuit at Gettysburg, now saw the man who would fight doggedly until he won. He ordered Grant east to replace Meade in command of the Union armies with a newly created rank of Lieutenant General. I think the war was won because Grant was able to get the armies all over the continent working in harmony. And he tries very hard to put everything in motion simultaneously, uh, making the best use he can of available generals so that the war can be won. 
not in the East or in the West, but simply be one. Thinking big, Grant implemented a strategy to destroy the two largest remaining Confederate armies, Lee's in Virginia and Joseph E. Johnston's in Georgia. For the Virginia operation, Grant kept General Meade in command of the 120,000-man Army of the Potomac, but with belligerent new instructions. He was told, wherever Lee goes, there you will go also. Fighting had begun that characterized much of the horrifying campaign. In a dense and tangled woods called the Wilderness, Lee organized a bloody defense. Artillery set off brush fires that cremated hundreds of the wounded. In the three days of fighting, the Union lost 18,000 men to Lee's 11,000. Under past commanders, the Federal Army would have pulled back to lick its wounds, but Grant's orders to Meade were to press forward against the losses while the second prong of the Union plan went forward. The southern half of Grant's All Fronts campaign was put under a ferocious fighter, General William Sherman. He would be directing the Union armies of the Tennessee, Ohio, and the Cumberland against Confederate General Joseph Johnston. General William Tecumseh Sherman is uh, one of my personal favorites. He is uh, an innovative man. He is a, an inspiring leader. He was erratic and uh, very demanding. Grant's order to Sherman was, move against Johnston's army, break it up, and get into the interior as far as you can, inflicting all the damage you can against their war resources. By early May of 1864, Sherman was fighting through Tennessee and attacking south toward the key Confederate rail hub at Atlanta. The United States Army had begun what would be known forever, gloriously or bitterly, as Sherman's march to the sea.